as, as was mentioned, my name is Travis Hughes. For those of you who came expecting to hear Mark Wadsworth, as an email might have said, um, I apologize that you're stuck with me instead. Um, uh, unfortunately, Mark had a scheduling conflict that he wasn't able to, uh, to resolve to be here. But um, as Liz mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about SQL. Um, I'm, also, I'm an MD-PhD student in Alex Shalik's lab, but before I, I came to MIT and Harvard, I used to work on GWAS, so I spent a lot of time looking at Manhattan plots. Um, I used to um, look at these a lot, and as, I, and as I looked at them, I sort of came to the realization that mutations need engines to actually become uh, phenotypes. So I was, I was interested in how um, these actually impact tissues where and how they actually are translated into, into phenotypes, but um, I didn't really know how or where to begin to do that. So um, that was until I read Alex's 2013 Nature paper. So um, I was really blown away that we could, we could take um, only 18 LPS-stimulated dendritic cells and find this vast world of, of diversity within them. So, um, and not only diversity and variation, but that there was, there was co-variation. So we could identify cell, cell states, we could identify circuits, we could even um, you know, uh, find biased uh, isoform usage. But um, the real question I was left with was whether we could apply this to uh, clinical samples and, and generate actionable data, potentially. So uh, whenever I first came to MIT, um, I joined Alex's lab. And uh, one of the first projects I started working on, we were working on profiling malignant melanoma. So we were taking tissue resections from uh, tumors of patients with, with malignant melanoma. We were, we were uh, disaggregating the tumors. We were staining them and sorting them and running plates. Um, so with that data, we were able to identify malignant and non-malignant cells. We were able to, uh, within the malignant cells, we were able to identify um, inter and intra uh, tumor heterogeneity. So we were able to look uh, and identify uh, differences in cell cycling within within tumors, and we were also interestingly able to find all sorts of variation within uh, lymphoid populations within these tumors. Um, and as great as this was, we were able to process three or 4,000 cells. Um, the problem was that at the end of the day, we needed more power. So we um, wound up with you know maybe 100 cells, 100 T cells from a tumor, and um, we, wanted, we wanted to increase the sample size. So being from the GWAS world, that was, that was my solution, but um, fortunately, around town, there was another revolution going on. Um, people uh, like Evan McCosco and Alon Klein and Alex and Aviv um, had come up with the idea that you could uh, barcode cells early in processing pipelines and then uh, combine them, combine their transcriptomes for ensemble processing. So one of the, one of the ways that um, was, this was done was in DropSeq. So um, cells and beads, mRNA capture beads, are confined in these reverse emulsion oil droplets. So basically, we have oil coming in here, cells coming in here, and beads coming in. And basically, the fluid is pinching off these little oil droplets in which the, the beads and cells are confined. The cells are lysed, their transcripts captured, and re eventually re reverse transcribed onto the beads. So we thought this was great. And we were, so we also have um, uh, a facility at the, at the Reagan Institute. And at the Reagan, we were getting all sorts of cool clinical samples. So we were working with Doug Kwan, and he was telling us about cytobrush samples where, where um, you know, they're able to look at sort of the earliest events in HIV risk or HIV infection at mucosal tissues. But they, they didn't exactly know how or what to do with these samples because often there are so few cells. Um, and then we were talking with Al Leslie at Kareth in South Africa and Sarah Fortune at the Reagan. And we wanted to profile granuloma samples. But again, we didn't exactly know what what to do. So um, Alex and I were talking, and we wanted to think about using DropSeq. But the more we talked about that, the more we realized there were, there were going to be some complications in using this for really low input clinical samples. So the first complication was that DropSeq wasn't very portable. We couldn't, we couldn't feasibly take a rig with us into a clinical suite or into a BSL-3 facility. Um, the scale was going to be an issue as well. So we wanted to do multiple samples from a single patient or multiple patients in a single day. And having to schedule all of this would be, would be somewhat difficult with a single rig or having multiple rigs for a patient. And then capture efficiency was, was really important. So for, for really low input biopsies, we were able to, uh, we, we wanted to be able to capture as many of our cells, but in DropSeq, um, in, in trying to avoid either cell or bead doublets, we often ended up with um, orphan cells or orphan beads, but we're really concerned with the orphan cells because we're wasting our precious samples. 
Um, and finally, there was this issue of temporal uniformity. So in processing a drop seek, the, the first cell might be in a different state than the last cell, since the last cell's been waiting in a tube for a while to actually make it into a, a, a droplet with a bead. So that might induce some change in phenotype. What we really wanted was something that would allow us to process our cells all at the same time in the same way. So the solution that we came up with, working with Chris Love and Todd Guerin, was to port the early bead-based bead barcoding implemented in DropSeq and take it into a simpler microwell platform. So what this looks like is that we have uh, a microwell device that we functionalized. The device has 86,000 wells. The wells are 45 microns by 45 microns, and they're 60 microns deep. So the first thing we do is literally pipette the beads onto the, onto the device. This could be as simple as a ball pipette. Um, drop by drop, we apply the beads, and they fall in by gravity. So uh, because the beads and wells are sized similarly, so only one bead will fit in each well, we're able to superload the device and achieve approximately 95% loading efficiency. So after we've loaded our beads, we can do the same thing with cells. All, we, all we're doing is pipetting the cells directly onto the surface of the device. Cells fall in by gravity. And so while, while we have 86,000 wells, we're only applying about 10,000 cells. So this allows us to have a limiting dilution and load our device according to Poisson statistics. So 90% of our wells have only a bead and no cell. 10% of our wells will have one bead and one cell. And then we have about a 1% to 2% doublet rate. And that's tunable based on the number of cells that you, that you can load. So finally, uh, the most important thing is the membrane. So we've developed chemistries that allow us to reversibly seal a semi-permeable membrane onto the device. What this allows us to do is exchange buffers freely. So um, in and out will go lysis buffer, salt solutions, other things that will promote hybridization within the wells while retaining RNA and other macromolecules. So this increases our capture efficiency while reducing cross-contamination. Um, and then afterwards, this is reversibly sealable. So we peel the membrane off, and we can spin the beads out and collect them and do, then do the downstream processing from there. Um, so how do we know this actually works? So we first did experiments that were uh, very similar to, to many of you in the audience. Um, so we took mouse cells and human cells, mixed them together, and applied them to the device. So we used NIH3T3 and HEC293s. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what, we wanna, what we'd like to see, um, if we're doing well, we're out here on the axis. So all of our cells are uh, mapping either to either the, the human or mouse transcriptomes, which gives us uh, a sense of like single cell resolution. Uh, if we're here, we're, we're less happy, but at least we're capturing something. Um, we're not, we're, it's, not, uh, it's at least partially working. And then, but if we're down here, we just sort of go back to the drawing board. We're not capturing anything um, at all. But uh, I, won't, I won't belabor um, all of the trials and tribulations that we went through to get to this, to this um, graph. But, but you can see that um, eventually we, we arrived um, at a formulation that, that gave us good single cell resolution. And um, it gave us uh, gene detection and transcript capture that were comparable to DropSeq and to 10x. So, uh, but the, the great thing about SQL is that we're able to do this with everything shown in the picture. So um, only using uh, the, the arrays beads, uh, membranes, and then uh, a clamp, we're able to uh, apply and confine our cells with, with the mRNA capture beads. And one thing you'll notice here as well, that, that this is really important. Question? Do you mind explaining the variation between the dots like in terms of how many components with a number of Yeah, sure. Yeah, which was your previous dots? Yeah, so I mean, we, it's the, the, the amount of variation that we see is very similar to, to DropSeq. I mean, you can, you can see. Um, that you know, there are some cells that, that do better, some that do worse. But we're um, this is this is was sequenced a little bit lower than than a lot of um, our our other runs. And so uh, typically for cell lines, we have um, transcript ca transcript capture that's on the upper end, uh, extending out to greater than 100,000 transcripts per cell. So if, if, do you expect that like with the increased number of sequences, like increased depth of sequence, you would more see a bell shape? Yeah, uh, so you don't necessarily see a bell shape. So you, you do see more of an exponential distribution. So there's some jackpotting in the, in the PCR that leads to um, many uh, just sort of winners and losers in this. And you see some of the winners out here and some of the losers down here. Um, but but you, we typically just uh, draw a line somewhere. Um, it depends on the cell type. It depends on the sample type. Um, for cell lines, the cutoff's a little bit higher. But for, for primary cells, um, uh, 800 to 1,000 transcripts is typically a cutoff that we would use to, to 
call a bona fide sell. Question back. So is it mixed just because it's such a low number of taxis, or is it mixed because a particular cell apparently has both mouse and sequence? So here the mixing would be that um, we, we would think that these are actual doublets in the wells. So for, for more mixing, what we would actually see is sort of a, a, a bowing in along the axes here. So if there's just sort of non-specific cross-contamination, we would see sort of a, a bowing in. But here we see very straight straight lines along the axes, so we think that these are more, more likely to be actual doublets. So, so once we had, um, you know, Used, used cell lines, just big bags of RNA basically. Uh, we thought we would make it a little bit more challenging, something that would more closely approximate uh, an actual clinical sample. So we decided we would use PBMCs from just a healthy donor. So when we applied it to a SQL device, we were able to um, identify you know, the types of cells that we would expect from uh, PBMCs. We identified monocytes, dendritic cells, NK cells, um, different types of P and D cells, um, and so one thing that we did, we also applied this in triplicate. So we found good cor correlation between um, each of the three devices. So we, on each of three replicate devices from the same sample, we were able to recover uh, you know, uh, similar uh, proportions of, of our cells. And further than that, we were able to identify um, uh, different, different phenotypes within our monocytes. So we were able to identify these axes of, of variation and in inflammation and antiviral responses that we weren't able to, to appreciate before. So now that it worked on PBMCs, we thought we would, would take it and actually try to apply it directly to clinical samples. So we, we tried to find the lowest input clinical samples we could find. So we, we talked to some people um, who have some IBD samples. And so I, for those of you in the back, I don't know if you can, you can tell, but there's actually a sample in here. Um, it's a pinch biopsy from uh, the gut of an IBD patient. So um, we're, we're dealing with very few cells here, but we're able to, even with, with this low input, sample, we're able to reconstruct um, inflamed and uninflamed tissues uh, sort of uh, at single cell resolution. So the same thing we were able to do with cerebrospinal fluids. So from patients with metastatic cancers, we've been able to take their CSF, apply it to, to the device, and in many cases there are only a few hundred cells in these samples, and we're able to reconstruct um, the cells that were, were in the CSF. Um, so at that point we thought we were doing pretty good, so we thought we would take it up an, another notch. So we, we decided we would talk with Sarah and Brian at the Reagan. And um, so, so Brian got his space suit on and uh, went into a BSL-3 facility to run some, some samples. So we, we used um, monocyte-derived macrophages. We exposed some of them to tuberculosis at an MOI of 10. And then we applied exposed and unexposed cells to separate devices. And when we did that, we were able to find these different clusters that, that differentially respond to early, early TB exposure. So um, here we're able to, to characterize these genes. We've subsequently done some follow-up studies and we find that early events sort of lead to differences in, um, in TB control. Um, but more, more to come on that later. Um, so we thought we would take it up a notch even further. So we, we decided we'd go to South Africa. Um, so Mark and I, so this is Mark, um, who is who's supposed to be here. Um, so we, we got together. We, we, you know, everything in the picture that you saw before, we rolled it up in our underwear, stuck it in our suitcase, and got on a plane. And um, we, you know, decided we would run some stuff in South Africa. And so we, we got sputum samples from patients with active TB. And um, what we can see here when we're comparing blood and sputum, we can see that um, there are these different signatures in neutrophils. And one thing to note here is that neutrophils don't typically f survive a freeze-thaw cycle. So we're able to, you know, reach cell types that we wouldn't otherwise be able to profile using, using um, other, other techniques um, if these samples were shipped, shipped over here, for instance. Um, so this just further highlights the, the sort of differences that we're seeing in, um, in neutrophils between blood and sputum. And then, you know, one other thing that we're interested in doing um, is sort of dissecting um, host pathogen responses. So we're looking for reservoirs of HIV, but we're also working on a number of other um, infectious diseases to understand sort of the ecosystems of, of infections. Um, and then finally, I think the, the coolest thing about, about microwell technology is that there's, there's a built-in address system. So uh, rather than in droplet-based methods where the drop is formed and you, you forget which droplet was formed when, 
and which cell went into which droplet. Here we can, we can pre-image the device. So we can do image cytometry on the device. We can load cells that are pre-stained, image them, and then uh, we're working to be able to correlate that imaging data with sequencing data. And the nice thing about collaborating with the Love Lab is that they've already developed uh, a whole suite of assays um, that are compatible with, with microwell platforms. So they, they have microengraving for cytosine, cytokine secretion. So um, they're, they're able to detect um, on a per well basis uh, the level of cytokines. They can do uh, cell killing assays, they can do paired cell assays, we can do up to 16 color image cytometry. Um, we've already taken one step towards this. So uh, the PVMCs that I showed you earlier, before we sequence them, we actually image them. So the one thing that we haven't been able to do yet is uh, say that this individual CD8 T cell is this in, in imaging space, is this CD8 T cell in sequencing space, but we're actively working on ways to sort of uh, pre-label the devices so that we can barcode the beads with uh, space on the array. Um, uh, and then, uh, so if, you, if you've liked what you've heard so far, there are some resources that are available. The paper's uh, thankfully been published, so it's uh, online at Nature Methods. Um, along the way, we, we generated a number of protocols that we've uh, made available to everyone. So it's uh, on the Shalik Lab website. If you go to shaliklab.com slash sequel, you can find an in-depth um, picture protocol. I also made some videos that um, explain how to seal the devices, load the devices, um, and uh, that's hopefully pretty helpful. Um, all the primary data are available on GEO if you're interested. Um, we're setting up a core facility at the Koch Institute so people can hopefully, uh, if, if, if it's daunting making arrays yourself in-house, um, which for many people it is, um, we're trying to get it set up so that people can just come and purchase arrays from the Koch. Um, but that's, that's in the works. And if you have any more questions, um, feel free to email sequel at mit.edu. This uh, is a listserv that goes to Todd, Mark, and myself. Um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions or help you get set up uh, with, with running arrays, pilot experiments, um, anything you need to get off the ground. So um, with that, I'll thank those that need to be thanked. Alex, my amazing mentor. I couldn't ask for more in a mentor. Uh, Mark, who's been my partner in crime in all of this. Um, Shana, who has uh, been a huge help in, in um, making all of this happen. Todd and Chris, who are great collaborators. Same with Sarah and Brian and Alan Henrik. With that, any more questions, I'm happy to take them.